It's summertime and it's the time for family vacation and all of us photographers want to take pictures, but it's not that easy. I know all of you have tried and you've had your challenges. So today we're going to give you photo tips for your family travel photos. Everything from gear, of course, we're going to talk about gear, but to photo tips and how to get your family involved in the photos. We've experienced it. We have advice. If you're watching this on YouTube, you should consider subscribing to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app because then you can listen to it when you travel and then we can get more Tony and Chelsea without having to stare at your phone. What's the name of the podcast? It's the Picture This Photography <laughs> Podcast, yeah. I should say that. And thank you to our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace makes beautiful websites incredibly easy. Any project, business, personal portfolio or video you can imagine should be hosted on Squarespace because you can get your own custom domain name. Yeah. You can control the formatting, the branding, the style of it. You can take orders from clients. You can see detailed analytics. It's all possible at squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Totally free trial. Make sure you love it. And when you do sign up, the coupon code Chelsea will get you 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. You could even host your family photos there. It's all tied in. <laughs> okay. I, I think the challenges of family vacations are pretty well known. Like they literally make movies like Family Vacation and the whole thing is a nightmare because we, we all kind of had that experience growing up because people have different goals, right? Like dad wants to spend time golfing and mom wants to go to the restaurant and the kids want to uh, go to the zoo and do something. And it, it's difficult to sort of balance that. But I think photographers have a special challenge because sometimes we want to get to some place right before the daylight starts and we want to spend 10 minutes setting up a tripod and that is extremely boring to everybody else. So we're going to talk about how to overcome these challenges and produce great images and have a good time. First of all, the very first thing you have to do your family, they're not mind readers, so you have to sit down and talk to your family about the trip's expectations. And everyone gets a say, and this is a family trip, so everyone should be having fun. But you need to tell them, guys, I'm going to be taking pictures. What I want to do is make a family photo album. I want everyone in it so we can remember this trip. And I'm going to be taking pictures of us at monuments. I want to get some pictures of, you know, one of the most memorable places, but I'd also like pictures of us all together. Can you all help me make that happen? And what you do by talking about it first is you let them know your goal so that once you're in the location and you want to stop everyone to take a picture, they've already been warned that you're doing this as a family thing and that there's going to be a book at the end or a home movie or prints or something else. So set the expectations. Yeah, and balance that against the things that they want to do yeah. too that might be boring to you. <laughs> Acknowledge that you are asking a little bit yeah. and give a little bit of a trade. The other way that you plan your photos is by choosing as a photographer what your goals are. So are you going in with the expectation that you're getting like highly posed, Instagrammable, perfect, frameable family photos with matching outfits. Because if that's your goal, you're going to have to plan a lot more, but you also might have to bring different gear. If you're going into it like, I want it to be fully candid, I'm not going to stop my family, I just want pictures of them, and on the side I'm going to get my pictures of monuments and stuff that are more artful, then of course you might go into it with different expectations. So choose the type of photos you want first. I think for every vacation, photographers should make an effort to tell the story of the vacation and think about how you want to publish that. Yeah. And your preferred way to do this is to make a photo book. You make these amazing photo books with what, like 20 to 50 pictures that you assemble yeah. and you tell some complete story and then you get that printed and you have it on the shelf. And that's so much more valuable than just having an album in Apple Photos or some sh gallery on Facebook or something, right? Because it's something physical that can last forever. I make photo books and I actually text members of my family and I say, if you want to be a part of the photo book, you can contribute your own pictures or you can help me take pictures. And like they really do. People send me pictures yeah. all the time because they know it should go in the book. You can make a shared album in Apple Photos. Yeah and between multiple people and then everybody can put it in that album and then you don't you're not like constantly texting them back and forth it's just kind of there another cool thing we've done is we have a digital picture frame and i specifically like the aura frame i've done a review on it the app lets everyone in your family that you invite add pictures or video and so that's been cool because you'll all be sitting in the family room and your pictures come up and it might be a picture you didn't take that a family member added in a different state and it's just fun to give everyone this goal 
of sharing a place to see the pictures. Well, here's a lesson that took me like 20 years to figure out. Plan for retrospectives. Like when our daughter graduated high school, yeah, we had all the family over to celebrate, and I wanted to make a little video that would play on the TV so we could watch her grow up and watch all of her adventures and journeys. And I did that, but I didn't do it quite right. Because I wasn't thinking about this, you know, 15 years ago when we were taking a trip to San Francisco. I wasn't thinking, oh, these are going to tell her story when she's graduating high school or getting married or yeah. whatever it is. So I would do some things differently. Like I took a lot of still photos because that's always been my focus. I would have taken more video. I also wish I had made a point of mixing aspect ratios better, like taking horizontal shots, taking vertical shots, taking horizontal stills, taking vertical video, yeah. because we don't necessarily know how our content is going to be used in the future. Like maybe when your kid graduates high school, everybody's gonna have VR goggles on and you want it to be like more wide angle rather than thin and vertical, which is the style today. Mix everything up, make sure you, you think about how to tell the story as well as how it can be used in big, important events like that. Yeah, that's true. And so that's, I think, your main plan is to figure out how you want to use the photos. Because what's more sad than just posting them to social media? I also feel like social media, if that's your only goal, it becomes performative and you can end up not taking pictures that you really want to remember for yourself in the future. Like mm -hmm. sometimes people get a little show offy and it ends up being disingenuous. And I think you kind of rob yourself of the experience of having beautiful photos. I, I hear a lot from people of our generations that they think their kids are doing something ridiculous, especially while traveling. Like, you'll be trying to take a picture of the sunrise and your kid is over here doing some TikTok dance with their phone set up vertically mm -hmm. against a tree. Respect those generational differences and try to respect that people tell their stories in different ways. Like, they have the same ultimate goals. They want to capture images. They want to remember things. But just because they do it in some meme format doesn't yeah. mean you should disrespect it. That is just a generational difference. And in fact, they are imaging. They are creating video. They are telling stories. You know, when, when we were younger and Madeline was younger, people were really frowning upon selfies and selfie sticks. Oh, yeah. Remember, everybody was really con. Oh, you want to take a selfie. I forgot about that. But and, and me, too. I felt that way because I was this, like, very controlled photographer, always taking pictures of things, but not including myself in the photo. But in hindsight, my favorite pictures are, end up being selfies. Yeah. When I see them come up, I'm like, oh, there we are with Dennis and Madeline, and we're doing something fun together. Yeah. But that's an example of me not sort of respecting generational differences, right? Like I was yeah. looking down my nose at this technique that I should have instead embraced. So coming up next, we want to talk about the gear that you should bring on your family photos, techniques for getting better family photos, and then we also have a few safety tips as well. But Keep, first. But first, we want to talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. Whether you want a final place to put your family pictures or you need a website for your business, you should check out Squarespace because it's super easy. I've made multiple Squarespace websites and prior to that, I never finished making a website. That's how easy it is. You drag and drop in your photos. And I like to change mine out frequently because I like to one-up myself and replace my old pictures with better ones. It's really fun to do. You can make a gallery and you can sell prints. You can have a store. Anything you can think of, Squarespace can make it happen. Try it out for free. Don't take my word for it. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Try the 14-day free trial. And when you like it, I know you will. Use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. So the big question, Tony, let's talk about gear because everyone knew we would and we're doing it. Can I just talk about the mistakes I've made? I like, love it. Like being in Madrid with no joke, like 15 pounds of gear in a backpack yeah. and then walking like eight miles in a particular day and, you know, deciding, oh, I want to bring primes because the, they're a little sharper and I can yeah. get some bokeh and then be like, oh, man, I got the 35 on, but 50 would be perfect for this. So I'm pulling my backpack off and like trading the lens. That is not a good time. I would not do that again. What I would do instead is I would bring my camera with a super zoom lens. There's a Canon 24 to 240. We did yeah. a whole video reviewing different super zoom lenses. Definitely get something like that for travel. Recognize you're not going to get the ultimate sharpness or the shallowest depth of field or the best low light performance but learn how to do the best you can with that because for one it's a lot less annoying to your family if you're not changing lenses but you're going to get 
better shots because you're going to be taking more pictures because you're just more versatile. So my philosophy on this is a little bit different. Mm. I think that the camera and the lens that you bring depends on your goals that you've set. I've committed to being present with the family but getting candid shots. Now I just bring a compact camera with a fixed lens and I just understand that I'm not going to get every perfect shot that I want. And I've also found that my family feels less pressure because they know I'm not in work mode. I will often travel with a fun camera. Like yeah. My work camera is a Sony A1. If we have a professional photo shoot or something, that's the camera that I, but it feels like work when I pick it up. It's like you put on your suit and tie. Exactly. And yeah. I don't want to do that on vacation. So for vacation, I'll bring my Leica, which is not as productive of a camera, but it doesn't feel like work to me. And I have more fun with it because it's like manual focus and kind of old timey. Yeah. So maybe think about getting an entirely separate camera if you're a professional photographer and your camera body feels like work to you. Some things that I think everybody needs to bring are a spare battery for your camera and spare memory cards. I bring a really big memory card too because I just never clear it. I just keep it full of all my photos and it's yeah, like storage. 256 gig cards because you do not want to fill it up in the middle of the day. No. And then I also bring an SD card reader for my phone if I don't bring my computer and then I load them onto my phone and that's like a separate place to have my photos so I'm not going to lose them. And, and I don't, don't re rely on the app. Yeah. I don't rely on the app. I like the phone card readers. Bring the extra memory cards, but a tip, hide them in multiple places. Like put one in your kid's luggage bag. You're like a squirrel, but with memory cards. Because I've been caught without a memory card so many times, either because I take it out to unload my pictures and forget to put it back in, or because I fill it up. I just buy cheap $10 SD cards, and I hide them around. Like <laughs> a little squirrel. Yeah. And Photo squirrel. But they have saved the day. Another thing is, don't forget your charger. And I prefer to bring my USB charger if your camera charges that way. It's just lighter to travel with the USB charger. Mm -hmm. um, and then... A waterproof bag. It could be a Ziploc bag. It doesn't have to be fancy. It could be a kitchen garbage bag and just put your whole backpack in it. Yep. Just keep it there in Listen, case. I have experience. We went on a hike once. Where were we? Glacier Park yep. in Montana. And we had our Canon 5D Mark II cameras. And it started to rain. And we put them in our backpacks that I now know were not waterproof. <laughs> and we broke both cameras. Not having a garbage bag cost us like $6,000. It was an expensive lesson, but it's free for you here right now. <laughs> yeah. You bring a plastic bag. Um, and then when it comes to safety and security of your camera, we like to bring air tags. We have one in our bag. We have them on our camera. Uh, and then we also have camera insurance. Ours is through our homeowner's insurance. So double check and make sure that that applies when you travel. If not, you can get insurance through places like PPA. Get a separate air tag for every bag that you're traveling with. Because it might not help in the event of theft, but if the airline loses your bag, you'll be able to say, hey, it's in Chicago. I can see it. Yeah. And when you put it on your camera, I've forgotten it, my camera at a restaurant. And I get a beep on my phone as soon as I'm like 50 feet from the restaurant that you forgot your camera. And I can run back and grab it real quick. I just saw a video online where people were traveling and they had uh, AirTag in their bag and someone stole it. And the police went and tracked them down. Yeah. They're not perfect, but they are useful. It's a little hope. And the gear is important, but I also encourage people to learn how to do good photography with your smartphone. Mm -hmm. A lot of photographers, they're like, oh, no, you can't get good pictures with the phone. But first, if you can afford it, upgrade to one of the new pro iPhones or the high-end version of the Android phone because they do produce significantly better images. But also, we have a full tutorial on how to get good images out of your smartphone. If you treat this like another imaging tool, mm -hmm. you will use it a lot and create better overall images. It's also there are things it can do that your camera can't. Um, it's better at long ex exposures inside where if you've traveled, you know, a lot of places don't allow tripods or monopods. Mm -hmm. So if your camera can do a good long exposure in a dark indoor place, that's going to be helpful. It's more weatherproof. So if your camera isn't and it's tied up in that plastic bag I recommended in your camera bag, then you can use your weather proof phone uh, and it's also always with you so it's a good backup yeah and you can share stuff instantly and maybe one of the biggest reasons is it's it's also much less likely to be stolen because they have anti-theft features that traditional cameras don't so we went to barcelona and i happened to be reviewing the fuji gfx 50r and total it was like six seven thousand dollars in gear and i 
get a message from Ira Block, famous National Geographic photographer, and he says, hey, I do photo tours there. Do not bring an expensive camera into public. You will get robbed. <laughs> so I had this dream medium format camera, and then I had a very well-reputed photographer telling me not to take it out. So I didn't take it out. I trusted I, him, but I had to do all my photography at that point with a smartphone. Just hold on one second. Just because we're quoting Ira, I do believe he said he did a photo tour there and like a bunch of people got robbed. Yeah. And then we filled in the dots. He didn't say don't, but he was like, be careful. So if you're in a more, in an area with high theft and you want to leave the camera at home, or if you're going to be going out at night where you think it's not as safe, at least you'll have a backup camera. Can I also add a drone can be a really powerful component to the storytelling, but you have to research the local drone laws because it varies from place to place. You might not be able to bring it into the country at all. You might not be able to fly it under certain circumstances. So plan out your drones, but they're so useful for getting wide establishing shots, stills or video. All right, let's get into the part where we talk about the practical side of taking the photos, if your family isn't cooperative, or if you want to make sure you get good shots. Tony, you have a little, like, secret. Yeah, I like early morning light mm -hmm. photos. The streets tend to be a little more empty, so if you're taking abstract photos of building, it's a good opportunity, but nobody in my family likes to get up early. <laughs> so often what I'll do is I will get up early and go take my pictures, and then I come back with coffee and some breakfast sandwiches. And when you come back with coffee and food, you find out people are pretty grateful that you went out instead of resenting you for bailing on them. I also like to look for photo opportunities, you know, a beautiful fountain or a scene or something. And mm -hmm. then I start my search there in Google Maps or TripAdvisor and I sort of draw a radius and I find things the rest of the family might want to do, like a really excellent restaurant or a kid's activity. And that way we have an excuse to go to that region, but nobody feels left out, like there's something in it for everybody. Yes, just considering everyone. Another tip I have is to be more real and genuine with your photos, because I think in the age of social media, we've all learned to over curate and be more performative about what we're sharing, rather than actually just taking pictures for our future selves. So it's good to document some less flattering moments. Our daughter Madeline's always been a good traveler, but one time she was just having a hard time and she got distracted walking into the elevator and bumped her head and ended up with like this big knot on her head and she was all like grumpy and tired. I remember what distracted her. There was like a cute boy in the elevator. Whoa, oh, well, we don't have to share that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just made it all that much worse for her. Yeah, him. it was a horrible moment, but we did get a picture. And we never shared it on social media. We never shared it with anyone. But it was like a funny, difficult parenting moment that we would remember and just kind of laugh. So if your kids are crying on the beach because their ice cream fell, or they ran away from you and jumped into the fountain to grab pennies, it may be stressful in the moment, but it's probably going to be a funny picture for you to remember. So don't forget to get those real moments even if they, you might not want to share them publicly. And photographers are taught to shoot in the golden hour, the blue hour, and planning around light can really do a lot to improve your images. And we have this simple technique where during the midday, when the light isn't that great, we are doing the indoor stuff. We're going to the museums and walking around, maybe doing the th things the kids like. And then when the light is nice, we might go find the location where we want to take pictures. I also have a technique where I use my smartphone and if there's something that I think will be pretty when the light's different I'll take a picture of it with my smartphone when you use your smartphone it will GPS tag it and then you can go into the photo and find where it was on a map so you can circle back there under more ideal lighting conditions yeah and I think another thing if you are planning to take those posed pictures of your family with matching outfits or anything you'll want to plan around the light and also the time of day so the early morning shoots might actually be better for that type of thing there will be fewer people your family is not going to be all like haggard and tired from a long day of activities they'll be like fresh their clothes will be fresh the, the day will be new you'll be more likely to get nice pictures at the beginning of the day and nice light and then another tip for getting good candid photos is to give kids a task. So if you're at the beach and they just want your attention and you can't get good candids, you could say like, oh, let's find some shells and get them engaged in an activity and then get candids. Um, if you have older kids, it might be just a more sophisticated thing like, oh, in the city, there's a lot of gargoyles on the buildings. Can you find some? And when they're engaged in something and thinking about something, you can get photos of them looking pensive or thoughtful or just looking like themselves rather than being like everyone stand there and say cheese and then my f 
my final method is to share the photos, make everyone a part of it. So when you're done taking the pictures, if you want to make a slideshow and then have like a movie night where you watch your home movie with popcorn or um, you want to share the book with everyone, once people see the final application and they're excited to see that, they'll be more likely to cooperate in the future. Yeah, think what you can do to make your family want to go on vacation with you mm -hmm. again so they don't end up with the family vacation memories that so many of us have where we kind of dread that outing. Yeah. Try to make it fun for people. Well, Maya and Madeline have actually started telling us about photographic places, photogenic places, because they want to be a part of it. Once they saw some really cool pictures of themselves that they like, they're like, hey, there's a cool art alley over here let's go get pictures there or okay get a picture of me on this statue or they want to be a part of it now that they see that the project is to make them look cool so yeah, yeah when we traveled with them a lot it was sort of in the era where showing yourself as being cool on instagram was really in. yeah and i would specifically seek out instagrammable opportunities which was not my style of photography I wouldn't want to take a picture of myself with one of those huge sundays that have like has like full-size candy bars in it yeah but that was really cool on instagram at the time yeah so i would seek those things out to give them the opportunity to take their pictures because they didn't necessarily have the travel skills they needed to find it and get themselves there but they were super happy when they were there and they were taking pictures and telling the stories in their own way and that made them want to go on trips with us in the future it did. We have fun, don't we? I want to hear all of your travel tips because I know some of you are going to have some good ones. Um, how does your family feel? Is it really difficult to get pictures of them or are they more cooperative and appreciating that you're taking pictures? Let us know down in the comments below. And of course, if you like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube or to our podcast wherever podcasts are available. It's called the Picture This Photography Podcast. And we talk about everything from gear to the future of photography to tips about photography. We cover it all. And of course, thank you Squarespace for making this podcast possible. If you'd like your very own website where you can host your pictures, your business, your store, or anything else, go your to- blog for your family vacation yes. photos. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks. Thanks Squarespace.